Thank you for being here tonight. We're gonna go ahead and get started so we can honor everyone's time. Um, and for the students there, yes, there will be cookies after. I've heard questions. Thank you all for being here tonight. Um, just by a quick show of hands, how many class of 71 alums do I have here? Can we get a round of applause for the alums in the room? So tonight is our second speaker series of the year, um, and we are very excited to have one of Marion's own here to talk about a subject that I think is gonna be of interest to a lot of people tonight. Um, and then we'll be at the gala tonight, tomorrow night to celebrate all the work that's being done. So um, I wanna quickly introduce uh, Ms. Alana, Hol Alana Holm, sorry. Alana. Elana. Elana. See, the, she taught ENL for many years, so the enunciation on the right syllable, and I fail at this miserably. So, Elana Hull is um, the author of um, many books, but one of which is A Few Minor Adjustments Two Years in Afghanistan, A Peace Corps Odyssey, which w is outside afterwards, and she is more than happy to um, sign your book or talk to you more about that. Um, and all proceeds of, from the sale of that book um, support initiatives that benefit the women and children of Af Afghanistan. Both 1971 graduates of Marion University, um, Alana um, then Weiss, and um, her husband, Michael, married their senior year in order to apply to the Peace Corps as a couple. Just out of college, they spent two years teaching, traveling, and experiencing the culture of Afghanistan. As Peace Corps volunteers, they learned as much as they taught during their time in the country, and it changed the trajectory of their lives. This is their story from the historic period as gleaned from memories, conversations, and letters home. Their story transports the audience from the country's enigmatic mountains, deserts, and villages, and before 20 years of nonstop fighting. Her presentation will cover a brief history of the Peace Corps, their assignment in Afghanistan, and a brief history of the country that got us to, the country that got us to where we are today. Please welcome Marion's own Ilana Holm. First of all, can you hear me in the back? Okay, good. Um, secondly, if this is not church, so if you feel like you want to come down closer, feel free to do that. So I am so excited to be back at Marion. Uh, and I think those of you who are students here are so lucky to be here. I thought of a lot of things I could talk about tonight, uh, not only my life and travels and my book writing, my teaching. But um, I wanted to talk just a minute about what Marion me meant to me or means to me now. Um, Marion taught me, this was back in the 60s, late 60s, to reach outside my comfort zone, to do things I'd never tried before. I was a country girl, farm girl, lived in southern Indiana and had hardly traveled at all. And uh, to come to the the big city of Indianapolis and go to college on my own. So um, I tried lots of new things, um, one of which was writing, and hence my writing books. Um, it taught me to look at the larger world, world I didn't know was out there before. Um, I met my husband here, Michael sitting right over here. Um, the second day of school my freshman year. And the rest was history. In fact, Michael and I were the first um, students to be married in the college chapel. And we, were told, we wanted to do that because we wanted to apply to Peace Corps together as a couple. And so we were getting married at Christmas, right, before, right after Christmas break. And the bishop told us, well, he would let us do it, but he was not going to make a habit of it. So as you know now, lots of people do get married in the college chapel. Um, Marion taught me to look at service to others and to care for the earth. And Marion also gave me these 1971 graduates, lifelong friends, people that we love meeting and visiting with today. So I hope that those of you who are students here take advantage of some of those things that Marion has to offer you. It's three times as big now as it was then, but it's still an intimate college. So enjoy. Um, I would like to thank uh, all of those who were involved in getting me here. It was a long process, but I am here. 
So uh, I just wanted to talk just a little bit about uh, Marion, and then I want to talk about the Peace Corps a little bit, because a lot of you are global, your history majors or global study majors, and you're thinking, what am I going to do after I graduate? At least I hope that's what you're thinking. Your parents are probably hoping you're thinking that. Um, so, and then if we have time, a little bit of history of Afghanistan. So uh, Peace Corps has three goals. How many of you have ever heard of Peace Corps? Wonderful. Um, some of us were Kennedy kids. We grew up during the Kennedy era, and President Kennedy started the Peace Corps. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Uh, but the three goals of Peace Corps were to help the people of interested countries to meet their needs for trained men and women. One of the only organizations of the U.S. government where the country invites Americans to come in and work with their population. It's not American government sending people over there and saying, you need this. It's saying, we need this. Can you provide people to help us with these um, these areas. So that's number one. Number two is to help promote a better understanding of America on the part of the people served. So when you go to a country, you're given a job to do, and hopefully by learning their language, their culture, living in the kind of houses they live in, eating the food they live, and not making more than what you need to live on in that particular country, they can learn about you, and you certainly learn a lot about them. And the third is when you come back to the United States, whatever job you have, to try to help other people better understand what's going on in these developing countries. So those are the three goals of Peace Corps, and I guess I'm here doing number three. Uh, a few facts. It was established in 1961 by John F. Kennedy. Uh, it says 61st anniversary, but we're on the 62nd anniversary this year. Peace Corps has served in 142 developing countries, all at the request of that country's government. And it has had over 240,000 volunteers. Think of the global knowledge we have as a group. I often wonder why the federal government doesn't use some of what we've learned to help them make policy and that kind of thing. Uh, what kind of things do volunteers do? As you can see, the major um, area is education of all sorts. It could be science education, it could be teacher education, it could be English education, health, youth development to help uh, the young people of the countries we serve to become leaders, agriculture, um, community development, the environment, uh, and Peace Corps Response uh, is an organization, part of Peace Corps, that was just started for short-term um, uh, uh, service. Usually when you sign up for Peace Corps, you sign up for 27 months. The first three months you're in training, learning the language and the culture and the job that you're going to be doing. And then the next two years you are serving in that capacity. Um, but Peace Corps response, sometimes they just need somebody to help them through a program for six months or a year. And this is a new program that was started fairly recently. So 2% of the people serve in that. These are the countries they serve in. So when, um, when Mike and I applied to the Peace Corps, we kept waiting and waiting for them to contact us. And it's a pretty lengthy process to do that. And one night, we got the call. And first of all, they asked you, where might you like to serve? And you think, well, I'd like to serve someplace like the South Sea Islands. <laughs> Uh, or uh, South America, because I speak a little bit of Spanish, or Africa, because I know about that. Um, don't ask for Europe. They don't, they don't need us. They're not a second world country, second uh, uh, developing country. Anyway, so we got this call, and it said, how would you like to serve in Afghanistan? Mike and I look at each other. We're on the phone together. No cell phones in those days. And we said, sure. And they said, OK, we'll send paperwork for you. And we hung up the phone, and we looked at each other, and we said, where in the heck is Afghanistan? <laughs> because in the 1970s, no one had ever heard of this place. 
Uh, so a pretty unusual place to go. And Mike said, we were, you know, newly married. And Mike said, well, you know, when we did our vows, you promised to love, honor, and obey me and follow me to the ends of the earth. I think this is the end. <laughs> so that was where we spent our honeymoon. So um, um, the Caribbean has about 5% of the population. Of course, it's tiny islands. Central and South America, about 19%. 45% in Africa. There is a huge uh, 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 Peace Corps population in Africa. The North Africa and the Middle East, not so many. Um, because they're developing with, with the oil money that they have there. 13% uh, in Central Europe, 12 in Asia, and 4% in the Pacific Islands. So that's where Cur uh, Peace Corps is currently serving. Peace Corps in Afghanistan was started in 1962, which was the second year of Peace Corps. They had 12 volunteers go in that first year. Six English teachers were requested, four nurses, two mechanics. And this grew to over 200 volunteers when Mike and I were there in 1971 through 1973. The second year, they went to the ministries and they asked them, how many more um, Peace Corps volunteers would you like? And they thought maybe they would ask for 10 or 20. They asked for 200 more volunteers because that first group had done such an excellent job doing their job there. And they wanted more people to come in and help them develop their, uh, their country. Uh, it continued until 1979. Anybody here in history know what happened in 1979? Anybody? Yeah. Uh, Soviets failed invasion. Soviet invasion pulled all of the Peace Corps volunteers out of the country. And we never got back in there as, as a Peace Corps. Uh, our army went in there, as you know, for 20 years, but not the Peace Corps. Oh, it says it right there, doesn't it? Thank you. All right, so this is what Afghanistan looks like. What an odd-looking country. I want you to look at what... This is my old-school technology. Uh, up here, Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, its name isn't there, Tajikistan. Over here, we have Pakistan. Over there in the little tiny area um, uh, is China. Why would anybody create a country that looks like that? First of all, um, STAN. Does anybody know what the S-T-A-N at the end of Afghanistan, Uzbekistan stands for? The land of. So the land of the Uzbeks, the land of the Tajiks, the land of the uh, Turkmen's, the land of the Afghans, whatever that was at that point. Um, so all of these tribal groups were just milling around, going from one place to another, sort of like Native Americans had their own special areas that they lived in in the United States. Same with these people. But for some reason, someone decided that they needed to make this a country. This was back in the 1800s. Anybody want to guess what was going on at that point? Anybody? Colonization. Huh? Colonization. Colonization by two great empires. Who were they? UK. Britain. Russia. And they were at each other's throats all the time. And they both wanted this area. So they got together, and it took several years to create this country. And it is a country, it's, it's well, I'll get to that in a minute. So while we're here, there are only about five major cities in Afghanistan. Kabul up here on the right. Go down here to Kandahar, which you've probably heard of, with uh, Americans being over there. Uh, Herat on the west. Up here, Mazari Sharif, way up there by the border. And then over here, Jalalabad. So those are the five big cities which probably were impacted the most by um, the uh, soldiers who were in there for the past 20 years. And then what do you notice about Afghanistan? Mountains. Most of it is mountainous. And down here? Desert. So there's not a lot going on there as far as um, um, uh, arable land. Um, 
only recently has um, some minerals been discovered there. Um, well, I'll come back to that in a minute. So this, when we were there, this is the only road that existed in the, the blue, the only road that existed in Afghanistan. It didn't even have a road around the whole country. We did at one point, our second year there, attempt to drive around the country in a four-wheel drive vehicle with some other people. And to get from Anhoy and Maimana to Herat, we had to follow the telegraph poles uh, from one telegraph pole to the other. And we were told by the policemen, if you cross the border by accident, don't expect us to come looking for you. The, oh, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan. What do you know? How, where have you heard those countries before? Huh? Soviet yeah, Soviet Union, Russian republics. Now they're independent, but they are the Russian. They were the Russian Republic. So when we were there, they were governed by Russia. They said, if you cross the border, don't expect us to come and get you because you will be in Russian territory and we will not go there. But today, they do have a road uh, that connects this because they needed that to come into the country and bring supplies in from the Russian republics to continue fighting the war. So they do have a road there at this point. Um, well, I'll go on. So Afghanistan of the past, it was important on the Silk Route, wrote. And the Silk Route, probably you've heard of that, you've studied it. It was um, a route for religion and trade and ideas and philosophies and people interchanging uh, from different parts of the world. So back in the second century BC, up until the 15th century BC, Afghanistan was rich in history and uh, art and culture and uh, trade. And what happened to it? Uh, it was created as a buffer state in the 1870s, a buffer state between um, um, the two empires, the Russian Republic, I mean the Russian Empire and the British Empire, but it has never ever been uh, subjugated by another country. The only exception was Genghis Khan, and it wasn't a country then. So think about it. Many countries have tried to take over Afghanistan and have been unsuccessful. Um, Russia was there for 10 years. United States was there, along with other Western countries, for 20 years. Um, Ottoman Empire tried. So both good and bad. It says that the country is strong, but what happens when a country goes in and takes over as a foreign power? What do they do? Well, they leave some of their people there, their soldiers, and then they bring in wives and children. And so then they start needing what? Everything. Roads, schools, hospitals, government. So they build this infrastructure. Think of any country. Think of Senegal, that the French came in and they built this infrastructure. A French infrastructure, not a Senegalese infrastructure. Later on when the French left, they kind of made it their own. Think of any country like that. Afghanistan has no infrastructure because they were never subjugated by a foreign power. So that's the negative side of something like that. Um, Throughout its history, it has always relied on uh, economic aid from other countries due to its lack of, well, it did have resources, but nobody knew about it at that time. And only in recent time has precious metals been discovered there. Um, positive and negative. Think of any oil producing country today. What's going on in their countries? Turmoil. The wealthy get wealthier and the poor get poorer. Think of Venezuela in our own uh, Western Hemisphere. Wealthy, I, I used to teach some Venezuelans when I was teaching and uh, 
I would have loved to have gone to that country, but now people are fleeing that country because of everything that's going on there. So oil is not always a blessing. Um, a few facts about Afghanistan today. Most people say, think it's located in Asia, in um, the Middle East, I'm sorry, in the Middle East. Uh, people in the Middle East speak Arabic. People in Afghanistan do not speak Arabic. So they are located in South Central Asia and not the Middle East. Um, a population of about 16 million people. That's only an estimate because in the Afghan culture, you never ask how many women are in a compound or a family. They don't talk about their women. If you know what's going on there now, you never would ask, and I'll get to that in a minute, how many women are in your household? So we don't really know if it's 16 million or 20 million or 12 million, but they say approximately 16 million according to the last census that they did. Pashtuns, which are people who speak the Pashtu language, make up about 42%, and they belong to the Sunni sect of Islam. If you know anything about the Middle East, there are two major sects of Islam. One is Sunni and the other is Shiite, very good. And they do not get along together. Uh, Tajik is about 27%, and they speak a dialect of Persian called Dari, and uh, they are also Sunni. And then the Hazaras live in the central part of the country. Let's see if we can go back. They live in the Sibamian up there. They live in that part of the country, a very poor area of the country. <clears throat> and uh, Hazaras are thought to be uh, descendants of Genghis Khan. And I mentioned before what Genghis Khan did to the country. You think they're uh, friendly? Uh, to, to the Hazaras, uh, but that's about 10% um, of the population, and with the Taliban there, um, they are trying to get rid of those people, uh, either kill them or get them out of the country because there, there's no love loss between them. Uh, the, this is what it looks like according to ethnic groups. You can see that the Hazara, where the purple is there, these are the Pashtuns, up, up in the north are the Tajiks. So it's a real conglomeration. It would be kind of like looking at where Native Americans lived in the United States. Afghan allegiances. Their first allegiance is not to the country. If you ask somebody, what are you? They would say, I am Tajik, or I am Pashtun, or I am Turkmen. Actually, their first allegiance is to their family. The second allegiance is to their tribe. And the third allegiance is to the government. Remember where Kabul was on the map? And you don't have any roads around the whole place? And you don't have roads going from the villages to the main cities? What kind of allegiance would you have to the fe federal government in Kabul? You couldn't care less what's happening there. You're more concerned with what, what is happening in your village, with your family, and your tribe. There's a saying in Afghanistan me, let's do, let's do this, because men, women don't count at all. We won't do women. Me against my brother, because inheritance goes through the firstborn son, from the father to the firstborn son. So there's a lot of competition between the men and the family. Me against my brother. Me and my brother against our cousin. They join together when there's an outside force. Me and my brother and my cousin against the rest of the world. So there's allegiances when it, when it uh, impacts your family. When it doesn't, you're fighting your brother. So um, even within the family, there's not always um, a lot of, uh, what's the per word I want? Well, love and understanding, thank you. <laughs> and that's why there's often a lot of uh, issues with uh, the immigrants who've come into the country because they don't come from the same tribe or the same family group for that matter. So this was our first view of Afghanistan and we flew over 
mountainous terrain for a couple of hours to get to the main city of Kabul. This was one of our first views. The women wore shador, not in Kabul as much as all the other uh, cities and provinces. And this is show and tell time. Any volunteers to wear this? Well, I'll put it on then. Oh, you got a volunteer? Come on up. Thank you very much. See me? Yeah, I can see. Okay. Not very well, though, huh? I can see better than I thought I Yeah? <laughs> What's it look like? Looking through? Um, it's a little bit obstructed because, like, it's almost like a checkered pattern, like, going across, like, my eyes. But like looking through a screen door when you were a little kid? Yeah. Yeah? What's the first uh, word that comes to your mind wearing that? Um, almost like tunnel vision. Like, I feel like I can't, like, I can't see as free. <coughs> Do you feel free? Not really. Not really? Okay, I'm going to have you sit down and wear that for the rest of this uh, presentation. Okay. No, 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 come on. <laughs> um, if she lived in Afghanistan, she would have no choice. But because you are here in Marion, I'm going to let you take that off. <laughs> And I'm going to say thank you so much for being a volunteer. And if anybody would like to look at this later, the handiwork on it is gorgeous. So the women always try to do beautiful things, even though they are so restricted. This is all hand-done handiwork. I'm going to leave it up here on the table if anybody would like to look at it later on. What are, you, what are you referring to? Is it a person? Is it a thing? Are they educated? Are they smart? How do the kids know who their mom is? They all look alike. Um, they are now, and I was going to get to this at the end, but I say, I'll say it now. Taliban 2.0 said they were going to be a kinder, gentler Taliban when they took over for the second time. They have not been. Restrictions are rampant. Women cannot go outside of the house without a male who is related to them in some way, either their husband, their father, their brother, an uncle perhaps. But many of the women are left there without any men to take care of them. The men have either been killed or they have come to the United States through the uh, uh, special... Um, What's it called? SIV, special. Anyway, through, through the. Um, um, huh? Evacuation. Through the evacuation when, when in August when uh, the country fell a year ago. Um, they cannot work in any capacity. And during the 20 years that, that uh, um, the West was there, um, women were active in government. They were often elected uh, to be representatives from their villages to, to the federal government. They were doctors. They were lawyers. They were business owners. They could wear Western dress. They could go to college. And that all ended when the Taliban came back in. And it's only getting worse. Girls can now go to school through fifth grade if they're lucky. Um, um, they can't even work for NGOs, non-government organizations, which you probably know that term. Uh, they cannot work for the United Nations. They cannot work in, in most kinds of women's jobs, like uh, as nurses to take care of pregnant women. So just, it's a dismal place to, to live right now. Uh, men are selling their young girls into marriage at the ages of five, 10, because they need the money to feed the rest of their family. So I cannot think of a more dismal place to be a woman in this, in this age. 
Um, so that was one of the first things we saw when we got to Kabul. This is the capital, Kabul, a capital city of a country. And this was the capital. Mud huts, mud houses, a few, few um, uh, buses on the street, very few cars, being that it's the capital city. This was Kabul, the capital. This is the Kabul River, and at the time we got there, there was a two-year drought, and there wasn't much water, uh, but this is where all the jobs were done. People did not have running water there, most of the people. We, we did, but we'll get to that in a minute. Uh, they washed their clothes there, they washed their dishes, they washed their animals, all of the sewage, because there was no sewer system, ran into the Kabul River. You can imagine how sick people got, this is the, uh, the, uh, the clothes washer, the doobie, and he's washing it in a little stream. He's washing the clothes out of rock. Clothes didn't last very long there. And you can see they're hung up back on the, on the fence. This was where we lived uh, when we first got to the country, while we were in training. And this, it would be like, uh, what, what's a suburb of, of Indianapolis? Uh, okay. It would be like that, so it's a little bit outside the main area of the city, but this would be the, the street. Uh, camels walk by, uh, donkeys loaded with food. Um, little girl has uh, bread she's taking home for dinner. She's carrying, I'm, I'm not sure what she's carrying, bicycles were the most common form of transportation. Uh, animals, uh, a load of, uh, a flock of sheep walking down the road, a camel loaded with uh, fodder. Uh, we threw all of our trash outside our front uh, door and different animals, well, first of all, the paper boys would come and collect all the paper and make it into something else. Then the glass collectors would come by. This was a reduce, reuse, recycle in its early forms. Um, animals would come by and eat the food and then the, 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 the dregs would be eaten by the camels and whatever was left was what couldn't be used for anything else. Uh, this is the bread maker, if you're familiar with naan. He's uh, weighing out the non there. If it's not the right weight, they could get in trouble. Uh, the guy is putting the non on an oven, slapping it on an oven, and after about two minutes, it's baked, and he reaches back in and he catches it. And then he puts it out on the table. And we were told to stay healthy, be sure to get the bread when it comes right out of the oven. Otherwise, they take the water from the the ditch, the Jewy, the ditch, and they sprinkled it on that bread. And guess where that water's been? Nowhere you'd want to know about. So if you wanted to stay healthy, that was one of the things. You wanted the bread as it came right out of the oven. Uh, when fruit was in season in the summer, it was some of the best tasting fruit in the world. And you can see, but there was no refrigeration, no canning, so there was no way to preserve all this beautiful stuff. Feast or famine. This was our 9-11. Do you have 9-11s here? What do you call 7-11? 7-11s? Yeah, this is our 7-11. If you needed some nuts or some matches or that kind of thing, you could go to the little stores there and pick it up. He's weighing uh, out the figs and oranges in his scale of justice. Uh, this was dinner. Uh, because we didn't have refrigeration, the animals were slaughtered early in the morning, brought into the city, hung up, and that's where you would get your dinner. This was our first house. It was after we uh, became Peace Corps volunteers, and it was uh, built for three wives. In the Muslim culture, still in many parts of the Muslim world, you can have as many as four wives. And if you were able to support all of them equally, Islam says that's okay. You can have four wives. This one was built for three wives. We thought it was a really cool traditional home to live in, but it was really cold in the winter time. We had to run from one side of the house to the other in the morning. Um, <clears throat> and uh, 
So after one year of living there, we, we, we went to a different house. Mike said he wasn't planning to marry any more women, so um, we could get rid of the house. Uh, this is our houseboy. Because we were required to be at work 8 o'clock in the morning, rode a bicycle about um, five miles, and uh, came, by the time we came back in the afternoon from teaching, all the good food was gone. The meat had spoiled in the sun. So we had a houseboy. And the advantage, too, of having a houseboy is that he could learn Western ways and learn some English and learn how to cook Western. And then he could get a job and move on up the ladder with um, USAID people or embassy people. So it was mutually beneficial. This is our houseboy. Do you remember I mentioned Hazaras? He was Hazara. You can see by his facial features that he does look a little bit Asian. And um, Sher Ali was his name. This is our kitchen. Uh, this is our bed that we slept on. Now, you would, in America, just go out and buy a bed and a mattress. Here, first of all, you had to buy the wood for the bed. Then you had to go where they had the twine so that they could weave this. And then you had to go get material to make your mattress, and then you went to the cotton bazaar, and you bought cotton, and you put that in a taxi, and then you went to where they could sew up the, the material, stuff it, and no, no. First you got to have the, have the cotton fluffers come in, because the cotton had been matted down, and then they fluffed it all up, and they stuffed it in that bag, and sewed it up for you, and then you got in a taxi, and you brought it all home. So it wasn't just a one-day thing. It took a, a long time to get your bed made. And that was the same with everything. Nothing was pre-made. You went and ordered everything. This was our school. It was a UN-funded school. And I have no idea why, but they um, uh, had me, assigned me to teach at an all-boys school. I was the only woman besides relatives that these young people from all over Afghanistan had seen. I taught English as a second language. Mike was one of the other English teachers. They had um, what they called counter, or, uh, experts from all over <clears throat> the world teaching telephony, telegraphy, radio. And then they had Afghan counterparts who were learning how to be teachers for those particular subjects. But everything was taught in English, so it was our job to teach the young men English uh, so that they could understand what was going on in their classes. This was funded by the United Nations. It was a boarding school for boys, so we really didn't get to see the Afghans as a family unit, only the boys as, as you know, young men. Um, we, this was about five miles outside of the capital, and these were the nomads in the country, what we called the coochies, and they liked to um, set up camp here because the Russians were building high-rise apartments with running water. And so they had water for their animals um, all, all summer long. And uh, um, so we, drove, we rode by these every morning. Let's see, did that? OK. So these were some of our students. Some of them were as old as we were. We would take them on field trips so they could learn English in a more relaxed setting than just the classroom situation. And this was to a... Um, 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 stockyards. Yeah, stockyards, where people would come and sell their camels, their sheep, their goats, um, their donkeys. And then we'd go back and talk about it and write stories about it. This is spring in downtown Kabul. What do you notice? Mud. The mud. Yeah, the mud. And spring, all winter long, the women have been sitting in their um, homes uh, making these beautiful hand-sewn uh, wall hangings. And then the men would come out and sell them on the streets. Uh, this is the barber who doubles as the dentist. So go, go there and get your hair cut and your teeth pulled. Uh, this is um, scaffolding. They're building the, the apartment that we moved into when we were there the second year. And this is the scaffolding. Uh, no OSHA rules. This is our apartment the second year we were there. There were uh, shops 
down here, and then we lived up above that. And that was very common to have shops on the bottom, and then the owners of some of the shops would live up above, but they rented this to us. This is Mike. We heated with wood and sawdust. And uh, sometimes the sawdust stove blew up, but mm. um, this was looking out the window, and there were two cars on the street, and they met each other. And not all bad, because all these men that gathered within about 30 seconds, I don't know where they came from, but they gathered to see what was going on, and the little boys were there. But they had something to talk about over dinner that night. These are the roads going to the villages. And you can see um, Cobble sits about the same height as Denver, Colorado. So in about the same latitude, latitude and about the same height. So it is cold in the winter, and it's very hot in the summertime. But you have to do switchback roads to get up to the villages and over the mountain to the northern part of the country. Another one. This is a compound where uh, uh, several family members would live. The oldest son, when he took a wife, would bring the wife to live in the compound. And sometimes other, other uh, sons as well. The girl would go out to the husband's compound and live with them. Sometimes they didn't see each other for years and years and years. Um, one of the decorated trucks. Often accidents. Uh, this is a hotel, and during the day they would have uh, uh, tables outside where you could have your tea and your rice, and then at night they clear everything off and you can rent uh, a place to sleep on those tables for the equivalent of about a dime. And the Westerners preferred to have rooms so that they could, you know, kind of feel like they were a little bit safer, and you could get those for about 50 cents a night. But you also got the um, the bed bugs. So you always carried a can of DDT with you and sprinkled it liberally on the, the straw mats. Uh, a nomad. The little uh, nomadic girls getting water. And uh, I don't have a picture of this, but the little girls always had to go at the very end of the nomadic uh, tr uh, group and pick up the dung from the animals. And they had a big, a big tin that they put it in. And at night, they would take the, the, the dung and uh, uh, press it flat and either put it on a wall or put it on the ground. And the sun would dry it out. And then it's, it's very lightweight at that time, at that point. And they would carry it with them. And that's what they used to cook their food with because there are no trees in the desert. So they have to have, there's no charcoal. So they have to have some, some way of cooking. And that's what they determined that you know, they could use. Uh, they went to get fodder for the animals. This is the village of Bamiyan. And uh, anybody, well, let me, anybody seen this picture? It's the standing Buddha that's in Bamiyan. And it was blown up by the Taliban. Uh, hundreds of years old. One of the reasons was that it was uh, Buddhist and um, the Taliban are Muslim and this was not part of what they considered the Muslim culture so they blew it up. It should have been a UNESCO World Heritage Site but it's gone now. Uh, to show you how big this is this is me, this is Mike, and then a couple of our friends standing at the bottom, so it's huge. And the holes in here, hundreds of holes, where uh, the Buddhist monks slept. They hollowed these out of the, out of the mountains here and, and slept in there. And it was on the old Silk Route. So a lot of um, uh, ideas floating around there. I'm going to stop here just a minute. What's my time? Hmm? And read you something from my book. I think you will appreciate this, the young people here. So I taught for 40 years English as a second language in three different, 
four different countries actually, and then 25 years in the United States. Um, so one day I was teaching the vocabulary of relationships in my 10th grade class. Remember, these were all boys. Relationships in Persian, I learned, were quite complex and carried with them political as well as kinship connotations. The Persian word for your uncle's first son, for example, translated into enemy. This, they explained to me, was due to the distribution of land rights after the death of the family patriarch and landholder. After a thorough discussion of family vocabulary in English, I drew a family tree on the board, casually filling in the names of my parents, my sisters, I have five sisters, my brothers, my grandparents, my cousins, etc. And I was oblivious as to what was going on behind me. What an effort it took for the students to maintain their composure while witnessing such brazen revelations from their teachers. But they could no longer contain themselves when I assigned them homework of making their own family tree so we could talk about family relationships in class later in the week. What an uproar. Why do you think I created that uproar? I put down the names of the women in my family. And remember when I said, when they did the census, we don't really know how many people there are because they couldn't ask how many people are in your household. They were shocked, the class leader informed me, that I would so openly speak my mother's name and reveal how many sisters I had. In this culture, one never spoke of the female relatives in front of strange men. <sighs> Tread carefully, I thought. We have here an East meets West moment. We are quite willing, they finally told me, to let you see the names and members of the females in our family, but it will disgrace us to have to share this information with our classmates. Nor may you share it with Mr. Hole, who was also their teacher. After much negotiating, at which I was becoming somewhat more adept, we finally worked out a compromise that all of us could live with the names of the male family members they would happily record on their family tree. However, they would merely indicate with an X the presence of a female family member, and the assignment would be for my eyes only. When we spoke of families, conversations naturally drifted again to American engagements. F fiance, fiance relationships, marriage customs, I thought I had already covered this topic ad nauseum, but they never seemed to tire of trying to comprehend the mind of a Westerner, especially in matters of love and marriage. So, how much did Mr. Hole pay your father for you? <laughs> 10,000 Afghanis, that's about $120, is a good price here in Afghanistan. Nothing, nothing, really? Well, that is not our custom in America. Did you really get to see Mr. Hole before you were married, they continued? <laughs> Quite contrary to the rules of respectable Afghan female behavior. Yes, we went to university together and had many of our classes together. Then why would Mr. Hole marry you? Only loose women would willingly <laughs> allow themselves to be seen by their future husband. Because he loved me. Who silence while they attempted to comprehend this outrageous concept of love before marriage and of getting to choose your own life partner. After you got married, did you live with your father or Mr. Hole's father? We were still in college, so we had our own apartment, I explained. You lived by yourself, alone, at night? More shock and dismay danced across their incredulous faces. They found it difficult to reconcile this part of my life with the teacher they had come to respect. Once again, Eastern and Western cultures met, struggled to understand each other, experienced a tiny glimmer of comprehension, but in the end found the contradictory concepts too foreign and too enormous to fathom, and they withered in the effort. Although they profess not to understand the concept of love, they often ask me to correct the grammar of some love letters they had written. Surely these letters would never been sent, be sent as most of the women in their lives could not read. 
Maybe it was just a futile exercise in English, something other than the doll telephony and telegraphy lessons to hone their English skills. Or perhaps it was merely a means of relieving the frustration of living in an all-male world. Or maybe they were more sentimental than they normally revealed. After all, the blood of ancient Persian poets courts through their veins, but I could not bring myself to correct the grammar of a love letter. It seemed too much like prying into matters of the heart. So those were just, that was just one of the things that we had to kind of work through in a foreign culture, in a foreign country that was so different from our own. Um, I want to show, where did I put that? Oh. So I just want you to look at these different faces so you can see how different the people there live. Uh, look, different cultures, these are Pashtuns, probably a Tajik, maybe an Uzbek. These are some women. I was lucky when we travel in the villages, I was able to go into the women's quarters. And I could also go into the men's quarters if I was with Mike. He could never come into the women's quarters with me. Um, a, um, it's a really <laughs> yeah, he's got beans. His wife is made. You can see them up there. Somebody wants them. He sits down or he puts a, a tray on a stool, serves him beans, washes the di dish in the Jewy, puts it back up there. And, uh, yeah, that's how he makes a, a little extra money. These were the boy, the men who cleaned our, uh, uh, our school classrooms. These were some more of our young men, and you can see me and Mike down there in the le uh, left-hand corner. And we come to a few years ago. One of our sons is in the military, and um, he was on the first wave that went into Afghanistan to try to find Osama bin Laden. He also went in a second time. Um, uh, he said, we did not fight a 20-year war in Afghanistan. We fought a one-year war 20 times because every year a new general would come in and he didn't want to do what the previous general had done, so we started all over again. So no wonder we lost the war and the hearts and minds of the people of Afghanistan. However, they knew they had to get out of here, out of there, and this was uh, August a year ago. Uh, two more minutes for me. Uh, I do wanna, okay, this was sent to me by a friend whose son was in the, uh, um, in the Air Force where they were bringing uh, soldiers out in C C-130s, I think they are. No. I mean, I'm sorry, the Afghans who had helped the soldiers in C-130, so there's no, very few seats in there. And he did about 30 runs. And here they are trying to get in there. What do you see that they're carrying? Nothing. They had to leave suitcases. They all were allowed one little thing that they could bring on. Nothing. Not even shoes, no food for the babies. Just what they were wearing. Um, and then they get to different places. Uh, Indi uh, Indianapolis's uh, Fort Atterbury had 10,000, I think, here, and then who were dispersed throughout the United States. Um, my book is for sale outside. Um, all of my money that I've made for my books have gone to organizations that are working with women and children in Afghanistan. I thought I did what I could for the boys, I wanted to do something for the women there. I won't talk about this one, but I do want to talk about SOLA, the School for Leadership in Afghanistan. It was founded in Afghanistan by a woman who came to school to study here in the United States. Anybody ever heard of this, SOLA? Came to study in the United States. While she was still in college, undergraduate, she started this organization to build a school for girls in Kabul that would promote leadership of women. So this is why the, the Americans and the West were still there. And um, it was the first boarding school for girls. Like we worked at a bo boarding school for boys. This was the first boarding school for girls in Afghanistan. The 
girls came from almost every province. What does that mean? That the Uzbeks were working with the Tajiks, were working with the Hazaras to learn and be educated. Right before Afghanistan fell to the Taliban the second time, she knew that this was coming and she found a place to take all of these girls, a hundred of them, in, not Malawi, Rwanda. You think of all the places to go, Rwanda. They gave her, it was like a hotel. And they let her bring all the girls to this place. Somebody gave her money to get them there. Not only the girls, but they brought all the teachers, the cooks, the secretaries who were working at the school, all of them en masse to Rwanda, to the school. And she called it their year abroad. She thought they would be back in a year. They're still there. The 11th and 12th graders at the school are now going out to schools in other countries, India, the United States, Canada, wherever. Um, there are hundreds of girls who apply every year to get out and get in that school. Not only did she make sure everybody got out? She stayed until every last piece of paper was burned that could in any way identify any of these families who had girls in that school. Why? Because they would be hunted down by the Taliban and killed. I just think that is such an amazing story. And um, I think 60 Minutes did uh, an expose on this school. And you can see it on YouTube, School of... Um, leadership for Afghanistan, and hopefully these young women will be the leaders. They are amazing. And I'm going to open it now for any questions you might have. I hope you have some questions. And there, there is a, you can. How is it that, how is it that you as a young, long haired blonde <laughs> who wore dresses, American style dresses, were able to teach there? Um, first of all, I wore pants, and we wore long sleeves and long, long tops. Uh, we were in the capital, uh, so there was a lot more. I didn't get to that part, the history. The, pre, uh, the, the, pre, uh, the king at that time was trying to modernize the country. He wanted women not to have to wear veils. He wanted girls to be able to go to school. He wanted... Um, 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 what were some of the other things that he tried to do? Build, building more, more schools and hospitals and bringing in more Westerners. The people were not ready for it. Just because somebody thinks it's the right thing to do doesn't mean it's right for everybody. It was the mullahs, the, um, the um, religious, uh, they aren't priests, they're the teachers who were so ultra-conservative that... Um, he couldn't, he couldn't affect what he wanted to have happen. And I have a whole history of what, what was going on in Afghanistan over the past 50 years, but I don't have time to do that. Um, I had to prove myself. I was often, I had manure thrown at me. I had rocks thrown at me. Michael was very, very protective as a new husband. Poor thing, you know, he found out what it was like to be a new husband. Um, <laughs> So that's a good question, but I don't know. Does that answer the question at all? Well, I questions? thought I saw one photo with your students where you had on a dress and it looked like oh. no stockings. And no. I thought, how could that be? No. I mean, just, you know, like flats or something with a dress. I don't think I, I don't, I never wore a dress there. Well, if we, if we got invited to the, um, the ambassador's house, we could we were dressed up a little bit, but again we were in the capital where it was a little more western. Yep, they were used to seeing women, um, you know, dressed. We, there were also a lot of what we called WTs in those days, world travelers who came through the country from India or through Iran, going the other direction. So they were used to seeing that, and it did not make our job any easier because many of them were prostitutes. Yeah. Another question? We've yeah. got time for a couple more questions. Sylvia? Um, how were you able to practice, or were you able to practice Catholicism while you were there, and how did you grow in your faith while you were in Afghanistan? That's an interesting question, because I was going to do a whole thing on uh, the Sunni and the Islam, and um, uh, the Sunnis and the Shiites, and who the Taliban were, and how they got to that position, but 
I'll come and talk to your class sometime. And, um, um, we had a priest from Italy whose name was Father Angelo Panagotti, and he got a, a, a visa to come in as a teacher. And we had a mass every Friday, which was the Muslim Sunday, in somebody's home. And uh, Father Panagotti actually uh, had a very, uh, he was very well respected by the royal family. They often came to him for advice. Um, and so we had people from all over the world. At, on, there were also uh, uh, Lutherans and Presbyterian ministers there, several. So at Christmas time, we would have integrated uh, uh, services. It was a wonderful thing in those days. We didn't know what we would find. Mike's father gave us a Bible to bring along because he was afraid we'd become heathens. <laughs> was he there with the no. Okay. No. Lapat? So, other than teaching English as your focus for teaching English as second language, was there any like certain curriculum that you have to follow? Like, considering you were talking about relationship in a class, was that just your um, idea to bring it in to integrate into the class, or was there a certain curriculum that you have to follow to teach the boys? Um, the curriculum was to teach terms of telegraphy, telephony, and tele uh, the technical subjects. Um, but sometimes that got really boring. And you remember when you were a middle school student and you tried to get the teacher off topic? <laughs> That's what often, often happened. And you know, I mean, they're learning English. We don't want them to just know the technical language. We wanted them to become um, uh, 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 able to speak in many different situations. Yeah. And we did learn Persian. We didn't learn to read and write it, but we did learn to speak it so that we could uh, rent a house, buy vegetables, uh, buy our, our wood, uh, have, a, have a bed made, that kind of thing. But we were there mostly to teach English, so the students always wanted to be speaking English rather than speaking Persian with us. Another question? Um, so, yeah. What kept you guys going? Because I can imagine, like, just that change to go through and, and everything, like, what helped you guys be there? Sweetheart, it was our honeymoon. <laughs> <laughs> I like to say it was my mom's fault. Because she always taught me that if you start a job, you finish it. And we were not about to, to in fact, toward the end of the second year, we, we considered uh, staying for a third year. But we didn't. But we did go back overseas. Uh, after five, we came back home, we had three children, we got our master's degree, uh, and after five years, uh, we went to Iran. We landed the day martial law was declared in the country with three children. Uh, I have a book on that as well, if you'd like to read that. And then we came back, and we had no house, no money, no car, no job and three children, so we got a job teaching in Saudi Arabia for two years. We stayed for seven. And so we did continue our, our uh, travel and, and work in, in foreign countries. But yeah, you're right, it, it was hard. It was very hard, and it was one of the hardest countries that Peace Corps was in because it was so different, and people were sick so much that, um, yeah, it was hard. Um, as we mentioned earlier, um, our guest is going to be will gracefully um, willing to sign um, copies of her book and I am sure answer more questions. Um, I see people peppering Michael as well, so maybe asking her husband as well um, some conversations. I would love to encourage you to have those conversations, but I do want to honor time and thank all of you for being here um, and remind you to drive safe tonight. And let's give a big thank, uh, thank you and Marion, welcome home to our alum and speaker, Alana.